Okay, let's just see. So who, how many now would like Boris to be Prime Minister think that Britain would be safe in his hands? A few here. Okay. Some of you still determined Boris has. It's good to see that and it's it's good to, you know, think that others of you are Anyway, are there any questions that you'd like to ask? Yeah. Um, I can chance that. Well, first of all, um, it was once said that you can tell when a politician's lying because their lips are moving. So if you take that as the uh, baseline, you could argue what you just argued about Boris, about a large percentage of other politicians. Um, he's got an incredible popularity. I used to live in the Indy, so I, I perhaps uh, I've seen him firsthand more than, more than others. Um, I don't know what it is about him. People love him, particularly women, it seems, people vote for him. So if it's just out of one person, there's some sort of autocracy. I can understand why um, you've got a downer on Boris, but you, you've got to persuade the uh, general population. And if I contrast that uh, delivery, there's no question behind this, but it's just a general comment. I contrast that with the 52 billion that we took it on trust where there was an Iraq war, war worth going to war for. And I have to say, you know, we're 51.8 billion in, in credit with Boris, and we're not... Well, he voted else. for that war. Sorry? He voted he for that war. Yeah. He did. Yeah. Uh, SBB, yeah. he didn't take us to war. That no. was a bit of a moot no. vote, frankly. No, he didn't take us to war, but he did, he did vote for it. Um, no, I agree with Jeremy. I think the problem is, isn't it, that, that virtually all politicians have lost our trust. And, and maybe that's what gives someone like Nigel Farage a, a chance... <coughs> Um, the sort of chance that he's, he's got now. What I'm talking about is, is degree. Um, actually, you, you won't find um, similar condemnation from the Court of Appeal or the UK Statistical Authority or a lot of other bodies of most other politicians, in particular ones as senior as Boris. So I'm talking about a question of degree. And, and no, it isn't my job. I, I'm not here. I'm not a politician. I don't want to be a politician. I, I'm simply reporting <coughs> on the facts. You know, I really want. That's why I ask. You know, what what do you, you think? It's not for me to say. It's from, it, all I can do is tell you what I know, what I have found out to be true, and then for everyone to make up their own mind. Would, yeah. would you agree that the, the real problem with Boris is that? His love of self is even greater than his love of women. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I would. But that's why it's not just Boris, because, um, you know, it is all about just Boris. Only one person, only one cause, just Boris. And yes, actually, because I think these days, I don't get many whispers that he's up to anything on, on that front, because... He's been told, and he knows, he's not stupid, that if he were to do anything now, and if Marina were to leave him, that really would have a big impact on his career. And he can sort of almost smell the new paint in Downing Street, and he wants to get in there so badly that I think he's trying <coughs> to um, be a good, a better husband, shall we say. Also, he, needs, he really doesn't need Marina on his side. Yeah. Once he's in Downing Street, he'll then do a John Major way. What, flip flop on Europe? No, well, he got a girl. Oh, he did go a girl. He did, yeah. Who knows? Nobody knew about it. Listen, Boris and his sex life, I can't claim to uh, know that much about it. All I know is what's happened in the past. Have you met him recently to speak to? Um, actually, the last time I met him to speak to was two years ago during the mayoral campaign because the last couple of years I've been sort of mostly closeted away writing my next book um, so I met him on the mayoral campaign then and, and um, got manhandled by one of his advisors which wasn't very nice but um, yeah I mean we, you know I held up my hand we shook hands we had a perfectly cordial um, conversation yeah um, I think it's probably fair to say in the days before Tony Blair that Prime Ministers kind of served an apprenticeship before they got yeah. the, the top job, whereas Tony Blair was kind of the first one to Had to never been from, a minister, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. never been a, well, he would be the junior minister to go to the top job. So it proves that that is possible and there's a danger that somebody who's an ex-journalist without a great deal of political <coughs> experience or 
or political credit could get the top job, but it, it depends not on um, conning or persuading the people, it also depends obviously internally in the party. Yeah. Now, you mentioned the, the old, you know, the old guard are not keen on him, but what about Cameron's boys, should I say? <laughs> Um, well, the relationship you know, between Cameron and Boris. No, not not that relationship, but the the, the, the parliamentary and, party. Yeah, yeah, what do they think of him? Well, that, that's, that's a really around. that's a really good question, and it's not totally clear. I mean, those who have worked with <coughs> previously, a lot of them have now gone. As I say, there's been a big clear out on Tory MPs. Um, I think there is still a lot of distrust of him because he does change his mind about things. He is obviously quite selfish. He's not a, a team. Player and he does cause mischief. But I think what's changed so much recently, and which is why he went for this seat, is that Farage makes them quake in their boots. And when they're thinking, what on earth are we going to do about this, you know, populist chancellor and, you know, someone who can really talk directly to the people? And then they think, oh, actually, we've got a populist chancellor who can talk directly to the people of our own. Maybe we will keep our seats if Boris leaves the leads the party. Maybe we don't have to, um, you know, shack up with those awful Liberal Democrat people. Um, and, you know, if Boris is in charge, maybe we could have a proper Conservative government, which is why everything that he's been saying recently has been um, much more um, Eurosceptic than it used to be. I mean, he backed Ken Clark to be leader of the Conservative Party, and now he's trying to sort of out for all <coughs> for all. So that's what he's up to. He's trying to, he cannot be leader without being chosen the, the last two by the parliamentary party. So MPs choose two people who then go to the party at last <coughs> and then the rank and file will choose. He would always win that. Mm -hmm. So it's going through the MPs. But yeah, no really good question. You've had your hand up a lot of that. Uh, I was wondering whether you have an opinion on um, Boris's proposals for an airport in terms estuary. Um, well, I suppose the sort of the, the sort of slightly unfair thing was, well, you know, is it all about Boris the Boris Island, how wonderful, you know, legacy all politicians Legacy, and that would be a massive one. I think, I think actually, you know, he there is a, some genuine be belief there that he thinks that building up Heathrow, having more and more aeroplanes fly over a massively built up and crowded area of population is not a good idea. And in fact, most cities don't have what London has to put up with. So I think there was a genuine desire at some point to think about something else and the fact that then it would be called Boris Island obviously made that very appealing. I think he knew a long time ago it was never going to happen and went on spending yours and my money on feasibility studies, millions and millions on these feasibility <coughs> studies to try and keep it in the headlines beyond the point where there was ever, ever going to be any further discussion of it as a sort of genuine possibility. So I think, you know, it started off as, as quite a good thing but then he pushed it, kept pushing it with our money because it was so bound up with him as a personality. Yeah. yeah I'm just working on uh, what Cornelia said today. Right. If you say he's getting so much protection, uh, and you know, you know, I must admit my view is he's a very accomplished dissembler uh, and diverts away from anything in particular. But if he's getting this much protection uh, and support, then. Who are the people behind that? Who's going to benefit from Boris gaining power and why? Mm -hmm. Boris sells newspapers. Um, when my book came out, it was serialised in the Sunday Times. It was a really big serialisation because they knew they would sell thousands and thousands of more copies because my book was serialised, <coughs> even though my book is in parts quite critical. So um, newspapers, as you probably know, are sort of, you know, kind of economic time bombs, how much longer will they go on for? If they can sell a few thousand extra copies, that's really, really a major thing. So do you want to annoy Boris Johnson, who can sell lots of extra copies for you? Well, that's always got to be in the back of your mind. Is that a commercially wise thing to do? Why is Boris paid so much for his column at the Daily Telegraph, where everyone else's pay being cut, their hours and length of people being later because they think that he sells about, and well they did at one point, maybe not so much now, but that he, his column sold an extra 15,000 copies of the paper on Monday mornings. So there is that commercial um, calculation that always being made by <coughs> editors. But also he's the most amazing networker. I mean he's become great mates with the owners of the Evening Standard, for example, the most important paper you could argue for him 
at the moment, um, and was instrumental in choosing the new editor. Well, you know, this is the only paper in London um, holding City Hall to account. So that was quite a strange thing to happen. Um, and he has this wonderful mixture of charm and cajoling that is incredibly effective. Whether that's a good thing or not, I don't know. Don't is he stoppable? <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> that's up to you guys. <laughs> it's up to. I think. I, I think if the media at some point decided to treat him to the same sort of scrutiny as <coughs> other politicians, that things might change. But then, you know, um, my book's been around for a while, other things have been around for a while. He doesn't seem to really um, suffer from that. I mean, there's more of a debate about him now than there was, where he was just thought to be a jolly good day. I think it was more of a debate. I don't know. I, I honestly don't know whether he's, he's stoppable. Do you think perhaps on the <coughs> stage a character like him might, mm. just might be of some use when you're dealing with other heads of stuff? Well, um, he pretends... I mean, I mean he's, a, yeah. he's, a, he's a figure at the front. He's not the only person who literally runs government, is he? He's just a figurehead, isn't he? He, he is a figurehead. I mean, he's actually <coughs> quite good on the front stage because although he pretends to speak the worst French you've ever... Heard. He's actually pretty much bilingual. I mean, I've heard him speak. He went to school in Brussels for quite a long time. His father was both an MEP and a senior official in the Commission. So he's very. He is, in fact, incredibly European. He looks much more at home in Brussels than he does in London, in effect. So and he speaks good French, um, German, Spanish, Italian, and probably Turkish, I don't know. But um, you know, so. And that's actually terribly useful for a British statesman abroad because most of our statesmen, apart from Nick Clegg. Don't. And he's very good about sort of understanding history and Britain's sort of historical relationships with other powers and things. So in all of those ways he's useful. And, you know, he is quite famous and he's been on the David Letterman show. He's, um, you know, I, I've been um, <coughs> his biographer. I've been on German primetime news three times talking about him. Um, you know, ABC, Russians, everyone are interested. So, um, um, Italian Playboy. Um, massive country. <laughs> no one can put off in this. <laughs> but, you know, huge spread on, on, on Boris. So, um, he's a global brand. And if he... The really frustrating thing about Boris is that he is very gifted. He, is, he can be really charming. If only he could put all his gifts to the service of his country rather than to the service of Boris, I think great things would happen. But... He's never really done that. You, you talk about Boris being protected and, and being good for selling newspapers. <clears throat> Could you not also argue the case that actually partially the reason why he's still so successful is the people talking him down is good for them too. <coughs> it's been particularly good for yourself and it's been good for a lot of other papers. So perhaps, you know, it's not always one way, a one way street this. And actually, him being successful, successful He's actually quite good for a, a lot of the people that seem oh, quite I think it probably is very good for other people. Mostly people who've been <coughs> nice about him and who will probably get jobs should there ever be um, a Boris government. It certainly hasn't been good for me. It's been a really, really unpleasant experience. And I think if you spoke to my family about this, they would get on their knees and say, we wish he had never, ever done it. So to say it's been good for me, I would actually really disagree with that. It, it's been quite a nasty experience, and I would never want to go through it again. I wouldn't want anyone else to go through it again. Um, I certainly wouldn't want to put my family through it again, who found it deeply upsetting. I mean, imagine what it was like for my husband, all that stuff going on. I mean, it was, it was nasty. And so um, there hasn't really been anyone else <coughs> pointing these things out about him. And it has sometimes felt a very, very uncomfortable place to be. And I sometimes wonder why I get so much um, correspondence and people phoning me up and emails and all the rest of it saying, please, please, please keep going, and why they don't put their heads above the parapet. Maybe they've seen what happened, that my head was blown off, maybe they've seen that they wouldn't. But to say it's been good for me, I disagree with that really wholeheartedly. And honestly, now looking back, 
in some ways I really wish I'd never started on this exercise, but it's kind of too late now. I am the woman who talks about Boris, there we are, that's it. But that's why I'm, you know, I'm desperate to finish my Clementine Churchill book, so then I can start talking about her instead. I really, really would like to move on. So it's not a good thing. Yeah. <laughs> Um, on reflection, the four criteria that you put forward, I'm not sure any of the leading politicians in this country would even read the Boris's score. <laughs> <laughs> are they all others? Okay, can be trustworthy? When they say one thing and do completely the opposite, don't deliver, all, all those criteria can be applied to them. Um, yeah, no, well, I mean, obviously the, the Clegg thing and the tuition fees and, and all the rest of it, um, you know, one can feel let down and know an awful lot of people do quite understandably and rightly feel let down by him. That's why they're talking to you, isn't it? Yeah. I think the difference is that if Nick Clegg went out there and said, I don't know, 27,000 people have got overdrafts as a result of this of, let's say, 40,000, I think I would probably believe that from Clegg. I mean, I think, you know, I might not believe promises from him in the future, but I think I would believe statistics from him. And I guess that's the difference, is that it's fine not to believe a politician's promise, but if they say that, you know, 70,000 people have done this, or 20,000 <coughs> beds are free, or whatever it is, if you can't believe that, then I think it is, it, the whole question of trust dissolves completely. Um, that's, that's a really good question. Partly because most of that time he was also editor of The Spectator and he was moting correspondent of GQ and he was having lots of affairs um, and he, so consequently he didn't have much time. Um, but also, he didn't take it at that point sort of seriously. He thought, because he got through most of life by sort of joking and, and things, that um, he, he thought he could do the same by being an MP. Not that he doesn't work hard. He does work extremely hard. He's a, a workaholic. I mean, he used to fall asleep on the sofa in his room in, in the Commons, for instance, because he was working so hard. He doesn't put enough into each of those jobs because he has too many. So... I just don't think he got it then, and he didn't take his constituency seriously. He had a huge majority, and he doesn't actually like confrontation. And when you're in the chamber, I mean, I've never been in the chamber, but I've talked to a lot of people about this. And so there you are, let's say, on the Tory front bench, and right here, or, or a bit closer actually, kind of there, are the Labour front bench, and behind them are guys um, and women <coughs> from places like Nottingham or, or places that <coughs> Boris is not really going to feel terribly comfortable in. And they're not going to buy the kind of you know, hail fellow, well met um, stick, the sort of the, the Bertie Worcester routine. And so he couldn't get away with that. So there was no kind of gravitas. He, he thought he could, and he couldn't. I mean, I don't think he would make that same mistake again. But to make a really good speech, you actually really, really have to do your homework and really actually believe it. And I don't think he believed what he was saying. I, don't, I think the convictions thing is one of his sort of deficits, if you like. He doesn't really have strong convictions. Yes, thinking about, about cabinet government, do you think that he would, A, surround himself with yes-men and B, be <coughs> presidential in style or accepting the, the wishes or the views of, of cabinet? Um, well, I think that's a really good question. I mean, a, a mayor is almost like a sort of mini president, isn't it? Because you, you don't really have a cabinet. You have, he has <coughs> lots of deputy mayors, actually. All very, very well paid. He pays much better than, than Whitehall does at City Hall. Um, but they, they're, not big, um, they're not big figures in their own right. He doesn't tend to want people around him that are, you know, the, the Prime Minister is supposed to be premium into power, you know, first amongst equals, and that's not really <coughs> Boris's style. I mean, he, his style is more presidential. And I think that's one of the things that you have to ask yourself. You know, how good would he be at creating a cabinet and then listening to what the cabinet was saying? Because he, he doesn't work in teams. I mean, something 
that a lot of people have mentioned about him is that he's not very good at speaking <coughs> one to one. So he's great doing mass empathy, so he'd be great in this room. But if one of you cornered him outside afterwards in the corridor, he would really hate it. He doesn't like that sort of one to one. He doesn't want that kind of intimacy or indeed that confrontation. And sometimes you would have to do that to so You would have to call in your health secretary or whoever and have those meetings. I don't think he would be terribly comfortable. <coughs> and, and that's another question about Boris. What would he actually do as Prime Minister? And I'm not sure that he has any plans. There's no Johnson, Johnsonism, there's no creeds, there's no ideology. I think it's all about becoming Prime Minister rather than becoming Prime Minister to do something. I ask this with the greatest respect. What's driving you? So, I mean, it sounds like he could do you a lot of harm. So why are you putting your neck on the line? Uh, well, um, when um, <coughs> how the book started was I, um, I had two premature kids and they needed a lot of uh, looking after. And so I basically gave up my career as a full-time journalist and went freelance. And then um, after about 10 years of getting them going, um, I was desperate to do something, something that I could get my teeth into, and I went to, this is a ridiculous story, but actually true, I went to a dinner party, and I sat next to David Cameron's biographer, and he said, well, you used to work with Boris, and I said, yeah, write a book about him then, and I thought, oh, okay, anyway, and the next day, his agent phoned me up, and then before I knew it, I was writing a book. Once I wrote, the, once I had the, 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 kind of gone past the point of no return, I wanted to do it as well as I possibly could. So my drive was that I, I wasn't just going to write the same old stuff that everyone had been writing. I had to do it properly. And I suppose there was an element of doing it from a woman's point of view as well. Um, I mean, I think there are very, very few female political biographers, and I think there, there is a different way that you do it as a, as a woman. But what I wanted to do was really do it thoroughly and properly, and really, really look at when he said why was why was it why or was it said and not just take it for red but go and check because <coughs> i like to do things thoroughly and this is the book that came out of that process hmm. um i'm just a little confused do you genuinely believe he wants to be a prime minister oh yes he wants to run for prime minister yes <coughs> well you can't run from prime minister but he wants to leave the conservative party and have a majority so, government in this yeah so, but he, if his hate of confrontation and his not overly enjoyment of being perhaps a MP, does he want to sit through Prime Minister's questions every week? Does he want to go through a potentially very scrutinous um, um, general election? Uh, again, a really, really good question. I, I think that he, his calculation will probably be that his charm and, you know, um, being able to... He, he's brilliant at not answering questions, you may have noticed, um, that he would, you know, be able to get, get away with it. Actually, I, I don't think he would long-term, probably for a while, that shtick would work very well. But he's a man of enormous self-belief. He does genuinely think he's the cleverest person in the world. So I'm sure he thinks that he will find a way of making it work for him. Um, but at the moment, all he can see is the door. I'm not sure he sees what well, opens the door and goes inside. What happens then? I don't think he cares, actually. I've, I've, so I'm not set here as a particular fan, but I, I, I suspect that uh, you're right. He's got he's got his sights on on the end the end yeah. goal. Yeah. Thank heaven for the civil servants that are going to perhaps try and keep him under control. Yeah, but I'd love to know what. Cabinet Secretary thinks. <laughs> is there any, yeah, sorry. When did he become known as Boris when his first name is actually Al? Um, at Eton. He, um, Marina still calls him Al. Um, when he was a, a, a younger child, he was, was deaf. <coughs> um, he had glue ear and grommets and was, was quite shy, as, as a lot of kids are when they have that problem. My niece had it. And... Um, he was also um, in his early years at school in, in Brussels. Um, so when he came to school for the first time, he went to Ashland House and then on to Eton in, in England. He was, he was bullied a bit. Um, and he wanted to reinvent himself as someone who was more English than the English, because he is part Turkish and all sorts of other things. And that process <coughs> had begun before Eton, but very much accelerated 
at Eton, and that was the time when he stopped being Alan and started being Boris. I mean, it's much more memorable, isn't it? That's why he's called just Boris. So he's his own creation, that's what I was interested in. Oh, yeah, he's his own creation, and a brilliant one as his too. I'm afraid we're going to have to take one more question, and then we'll have a wine reception afterwards. Right. Yeah. Um, Yes. I was very interested to hear everything you say, but I didn't... (coughs) I didn't agree with a lot of it. You talked about um, a politician's ability to manage, and I don't think management comes into being prime minister at all. I think the most an example of a manager we had, Gordon Brown, was probably going to end up being just the most unsuccessful and uh, hopeless post-war prime minister. He was a, a manager's the infinite detail. <coughs> but he wasn't a good manager. I mean, he, he wanted to manage. If, the you, if, you, look, wasn't a good if you look at... Um, some really popular <coughs> presidents in the United States, two different parties in recent years, Reagan and Clinton, you couldn't argue that they were managers. They had a charisma no, they are and a personality. Yeah, that's a different system. I think system, that's part right? of what Boris brings. He brings this, this personality that I think people latch on to. And whatever your political words, I think he makes people feel good about themselves. I think you've said in your, in, in your league table of criteria, I think you mentioned popularity three. Well, you may have come not to no, like No, no, I gave him 9.5. Oh, that's another one. You mentioned yeah. three. And um, I think he I think he makes people feel very good about themselves. And, you know, he's, he's human like all of us, got there's probably more faults than most. But I think actually being a manager is not really part of the equation of being a prime minister. Well, I, th- I, think, I think the prime minister has a different role to president. <coughs> Obviously, because in the, he is Prime Minister, he has cabinet, it's a parliamentary system. We have a very different system to the presidential one in the US, where it is more about personality. Whether we want to import personality politics is another matter. I take your point about Gordon Brown very much. He was a manager, a, a micromanager. He was just a useless micromanager. Mm-hmm. If you read a book by Anthony King, The <coughs> Thunders of Our Government, which is a brilliant book and about you know, which governments have made which cock-ups, the problem has been that the people in charge in our country have been very, very poor managers for many, many years now. And therefore we have wasted huge amounts of money on all sorts of ridiculous projects. We don't have good roads, we don't have the best schools that we possibly could, considering how much money we've spent. So that's what I mean. In London, we've seen that he's not a good manager. We still have all these problems with pollution and the police and all the rest of it. I think we can and should expect our Prime Minister to run things well, starting with the Cabinet, but also with an awful lot more than that.